Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're at the quarter point of the season, and things look like they might be starting to turn around. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, how's your week been? Uh, fairly decent. Uh, looking forward to talking some Flames hockey. Before we jump into the week, let's remind everybody what we announced last week, and that's our meetup coming up. It's a holiday meetup at Bow River Brewing Tap House. Um, It'll be on December 14th during the Flames vs. Wild game. This is not a live podcast recording, but it is a chance for us to hang out with you guys, our listeners, and talk some hockey, watch the Flames game. You guys can meet Matt and I. We'll, We'll be happy to give you our thoughts on the game. It's just a chance to get together before the holidays, have some fun. Bow River Brewing is hosting us at their tap room, and they're going to have some great deals for us. Dollar off beer, which means a 16-ounce pint is only 6 bucks, and $13 for a 10-inch pizza, which are usually $17. So we hope you can be there. Um, if you want to show up, the information is on our website, firesidechat.ca slash meetup2023, or just go to firesidechat.ca, and you'll find the link in the navigation at the top. Matt, you're going to be there. I'm going to be there. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, looking forward to meeting some of our listeners and hopefully enjoy a Flames win that night. Yeah, we've had a lot of people talk about how you know they, they want to meet us, they want to talk hockey with us, and we've had even some people say that we are kind of their hockey friends. Like They don't have a lot of Flames fan friends. So come on out, meet us, meet some other listeners. we got a really cool group of people here that interact with us regularly, that listen to us. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to meeting you all and having you guys meet each other. But with that, let's jump into the week, shall we, Matt? Yes, definitely. Four it was a busy games, week. Four games, seven days for the Flames all on the road. And they really got their frequent flyer miles this week. They started on the 20th in Seattle, taking on the Seattle Kraken. Three big milestones here. Mangiapane got his 100th career goal. Backlund got his 500th career point, and he becomes the ninth Calgary Flames player to do that, and only the first non-North American-born player. And the Flames are almost on the reverse of the Honda Center curse. They've now played six times in the Climate Pledge Arena since Seattle expanded. They've won them all. Yeah, and not only that, it's the first time that the Flames have had a six-game winning streak in a road building at any point in their history. That's crazy. Like, for as long as this team's been around and some of the terrible teams that have been out, you would think that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, like, I remember when I was a kid and San Jose first expanded into the NHL, and, like, those Sharks teams were terrible, and yet they would always seem to find a way to beat the Flames, even though, like, they had, like, eight wins that year. Like, yeah, two I mean, or three of them would you know, be against the us. The Sharks, the Thrashers, like, you know, there are some terrible teams during this the Flames' tenure. Yep. Well, we got to make them feel welcome, you know. <laughs> well, we don't have to make them feel welcome in their own building. <laughs> They're already welcome there. Anyway, 4-3 win for the Flames. Um, one thing I really liked here is that some of our our top guys got going. Lindholm got a goal. Huberto got a goal, uh, assisted by Kadri. Mangiapane got a goal, and the other one from Anderson. But, you know, some of those top scores the Flames need to get going got going here. What were your thoughts on this one? Well, I thought that uh, the Flames showed a lot of resiliency. Uh, in the second period, Seattle took it to the Flames uh, quite heavily. And uh, Calgary entered the second period up 2-1 to one and ended the period down 3-2. to two. And, you know, typically this team would find a way to just, you know, coast through the third period to a loss. And... Uh, to their credit, uh, they were relentless against Seattle and just kept pouring it on and on and on and on until mu- finally Manjapane scored the tying goal with just over four minutes remaining and then Rasmus Anderson ended it in overtime for the first Flames OT win. This yeah, and, ev- you know, and even after Manjapane scored that you know tie, I don't know about you, but it felt like the team almost went into turbo mode then. Like they just seemed to get faster and quicker and like, okay, we got to close this out there. And it's, you know, it's some adversity that they saw in this one, especially, you know, going down that we see so often from this team. And I think they responded better here than we've seen in most games. Yeah. And the flames have trailed a lot this month heading into the third period, but they have found a way to either get points by losing in overtime or bouncing back like in this particular game and getting the win. I'd rather not give a point to Seattle, but hey, two points, two points at this point. Yep. 
Uh, then on November 22nd, the Flames went to the Music City, Nashville, to take on the Predators. And uh, in the previous game in Seattle, Jacob, Jacob Marsham did not play. Dan Vladar did. In Nashville, uh, Dan Vladar sat and Jacob Markstrom played, and the Flames ended up with a 4-2 loss. What were your thoughts on this one? Well, this game basically mirrored, in a lot of ways, the Seattle game, where the Flames were down 2-1. to one. And I thought that the Flames controlled the play all the way until the weird 3-1 goal for Nashville, which really should have been a Nashville penalty. And yeah, then the one. game kind of ended at that point. Yeah, and I mean, you it, know, yeah. I, I don't think that the score reflects the way the game was played. I think the Flames played a much better game than the scoreboard leads you to believe. Yeah, I agree. And like the Flames were heavily outshot in this game, forty-five to twenty-six, but it, it felt more uh, like the Flames were in control of the play for the majority of the game. Even though, uh, like Nashville was basically just throwing everything at Markstrom, where Calgary was being a little bit more controlled with their play. Yeah, and we'll talk about this uh, later in the show, but I think one of the downsides for the Flames here is how many penalty minutes they took. They had 20 minutes of penalties, which is pretty much a whole period playing shorthanded. And I think, you know, anytime you're taking that many penalties, you're probably not going to win the game. Yeah. They they you, definitely shot themselves in the foot. You know, I mean, playing a whole period down at least one man, let's, I mean, sometimes they're offsetting, but for the sake of argument, let's say playing a period down a man is not really going to help. Not only are you down a man, but it jumbles up your lines. It gets guys weird ice time. Like it does all sorts of weird things to your lineup. Oh, I agree. And the handful of players that don't play on the penalty kill, they just get to sit there for extended periods of time and it just throws everybody's rhythm off. I do not understand how a play where it's clearly a penalty, where the guy grabs the puck out of the air and throws it out in front of the net, I do not understand how that play is not reviewable. Because, like, in this particular case, like, it literally ended the game at that point. That was the game-winning goal. And, you know, like, the whole Flames team was confused because, like, it was a blatant penalty. And yet... You know, like, there's no system in place to review that. And it, it just, it baffles me that, like, in 2023, that, you know, you can't review, like, obvious plays like that. Well, and, I mean, we've seen the coaches challenge. And, honestly, it's one of the newest, you know, changes to the game. And we've seen it evolve over the years it's been in the game. I mean, you know, there's been new things added to it, new ways you can use it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if after this, it's more opened up and I can eventually see it being sort of like the NFL where you can challenge anything you want to, but if you get it wrong, according to the NHL's rules, you'll get the two men delay a game. Yeah. And like, you know, and if they had reviewed the play as it was and ruled that, yeah, no, that was fine. And the flames got the penalty. It'd be like, okay, well, I don't agree with your decision, but you know, like the flames, did challenge the play, but it was, you know, like, should the play have been waved off, which clearly Mackenzie Weger did touch the puck. But, you know, like, the whole play should have been reviewed, not just the after effects of the, gl the glove pass. I and, you know, it, it's just, you know, like, in this particular case, it bit the flames, and, like, I've seen other teams getting you know screwed over by various missed calls like that and it, it's just one of those minor things that like it, it it's an easy remedy for the the nhl to just you know make it so that way you know on questionable plays you can actually do things instead of you know just being oh well we can't review that at all Matt, and, put your slide deck together and go present at the gm's meeting Yes. Because <laughs> that's the only way it's going to get fixed. I, I don't disagree with you, but as the rule book is written now, that's not really reviewable. Yeah. It's just frustrating more than anything. I don't disagree. And it's frustrating because it happened to our team, right? I think if it happened to the other team, we wouldn't have cared as much. Yeah. It still would have sucked, though, to win on that kind of a note. Well, the next game, there was no technical win. Uh, the Flames on the 24th went to Dallas, played the Dallas Stars. 
This was, interestingly enough, Martin Postel's 10th NHL game, which means he's now no longer waiver, el- or he's no longer waiver exempt. He's now waiver eligible. So if the Flames wanted to send him back to the Wranglers, he'd have to clear waivers. And I don't know about you, I was surprised by this one. Like, after the playoff series that we saw a couple years ago, I didn't, I always expect close games between these two. Flames with a big 7-4 win in Dallas. It it felt like we got the entire series worth of goals in this one game. <laughs> didn't it, though? It's like, uh, you are the same two goaltenders, but this does not make any sense. Exactly. <laughs> 11 goals between the two in one game. And, you know, sort of like we were talking about earlier, I gave the Flames a lot of credit here. I mean, in the first period, um, they were down after the first period 2-1, to one, but kept moving forward, right? Kept that pressure on. Didn't take their their foot off the pedal. I thought they did for a little bit in the second, take their foot off the pedal, but they were able to come back from that and, you know, bring their play level back to where they needed it to be. Um, Big shout out in this one to Sharon Govich. He got a goal and I think at least one assist, if not two, but I thought he looked probably the best. He's looked as a flame here. Yeah. He's starting to settle in quite well. And uh, when we acquired him, you know, like my thoughts were basically that you were getting a variation of uh, what we traded away, which is Tyler Toffoli. And, you know, uh, Sharon Govich is a lot better defensively than Toffoli was. Uh, he plays excellently on the penalty kill. And, you know, he's actually out contributed to Foley in the month of November uh, to this point. So it's shaping up to be a really good trade for the Flames. Yeah, it is. Um, I don't have a lot else to say about this. You know, I think even though there was seven goals scored in this one, I don't think that Dallas looked as bad as the scoreboard led them to believe. I thought, you know, Dallas was a pretty good challenge for the Flames and a very good offensive team. And I thought the Flames really had to work. And and I like that this game, I think, made the Flames elevate them themselves and say, okay, we can do this against a top team. We've now shown we can compete with those guys. Um, but I, I don't think that, I mean, I don't think that the score shows that really shows what was on the ass. I don't think Dallas was that bad. I think it, I, I'm surprised the Flames no. got seven. I, I frankly, like, uh, Ottinger had an extremely bad game. Like he there did. was about four or five of those goals that he could have had if he was on his game. And I think the it, fact that Ottinger stayed in the whole game too, tells you it wasn't all his fault. Yeah. Um, one person I do have to praise a lot is uh, Connor Zari. That pass that he made on the insurance marker uh, to Michael Backlund, that was a thing of beauty. And, you know, just good on him for uh, getting a, another high-quality point in this game. Yeah, I mean, Zari, Pospisil, they're both starting to look like NHL players. You know, we talked about that a bit last week, and I'm sure we'll touch on it again this week. But, yeah, I think both guys are, are showing that they have what it takes to be in the National Hockey League. This was exciting to me. A good way to start the weekend, a 7-4 win against Dallas. And, sadly, the Flames had to go at it again less than 24 hours, or just over 24 hours later from the start time. Um, but it was a Saturday night, late Hockey Night in Canada game in Denver, Calgary versus the Avalanche, 3-1 loss for Calgary. I'll say right now, I think if this was not a back-to-back, second night of a back-to-back, I think the Flames would have had a different result. Yeah, uh, I I think that Colorado played all right. And like once they got the lead uh, 2-0, they basically stopped playing for by and large. And like Calgary just took over the game and unfortunately Calgary like immediately after getting the 2-1 goal um Vladar gave up a really lousy goal uh to Nathan McKinnon I thought the Flames came out pretty flat here like they looked yeah. tired in the first and by the third they looked like they actually wanted to go yeah it, it was kind of a weird game in that like the first period was basically all Colorado and frankly like it was a lucky thing that it was only one nothing, and then Vladar, he played rather poorly in the second period. Like even the Johansson wraparound goal was a poor effort on his part, and the McKinnon effort goal was you know a goal that literally any goaltender should stop. Like a, a point shot from that was a floater from fifty feet out. Like 
you should be getting that. Why is the backup? Yeah, like that. That was like inexcusably bad. But at and the same time, for those two two goals that maybe should have had, I thought there was some they looked really good at here. In oh yeah, the, he did bounce back after the really bad goal, but um, it, it's one of those that it, because Calgary managed to cut the lead to two to one, and then like thirty four seconds later, Vladar gave up the the three one goal. Like it. it I don't care which team you are or what state your team is. That's going to deflate your team so heavily because it's like we've worked all this hard to get back in the game. And then, you know, a goal, a puck that is stopped like 999 out of a thousand times goes in and it's like, really? <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, I, I don't blame Vladar as much on the last goal, the McKinnon goal. Like, and McKinnon's a good shooter. He had some traffic. I don't blame him as much on that one. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I, I just really thought that was a bad effort. Like, put it this way, if I was the coaching staff, I would have yanked him right there. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of time left in the game at that point. You might as well leave him in. Yeah. It just, yeah, like it, it's. And I think as a coaching where... staff too, I mean, you and I have talked about this. We have to figure out what Dan Vladar is. And I think part of that is figuring out how he rebounds from a bad goal. I, I agree. It's just uh, contextually, you know, it, that was just a really bad goal. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. And it just, yeah, the, the team on the whole, like in the third period, like they pressed very hard and, you know, you have to give it to the Colorado goaltender. He played really well. Uh, Prosvetov, uh, he played really well for them. And, you know, but isn't this kind of the tale as old as time for the Flames that they got out goalied by, a, you know, a, a brand new goalie or a goalie in his first game in the NHL? Well, uh, yeah. True. Um, I mean, for how many years has it always been, oh, we're going against a rookie goalie, and then, you know, they get stymied? Yeah. Or guys well, first game or was like a fairly decent goalie with uh, Arizona for the last couple of years. Like, a, you know, a game here and game there kind of goalie. And, uh, you know, uh, it's one of those where if it wasn't for Arizona having a dearth of good goaltending themselves, uh, he'd still be with the Coyotes, and, you know, it, it just, they happen to be on a run where they actually have a few good goaltenders at the moment, um, which allowed Colorado to pick them up off waivers, and, you know, Very good similar, for Colorado. Yeah, I mean, similar to how we got Vladar, right? We gave a pick for him, but, you know, Boston had enough guys that they thought, hey, we can part with this one. Yep. Well, with that, that concludes the Flames week. They now come back to the Saddle Dome for a six-game homestand. And that also brings us to an important NHL milestone by a lot of people's metric, which is American Thanksgiving. And it's often said that um, you, you know what your team is by American Thanksgiving. So with that in mind, and I know a couple people, uh, Justin McKenzie has done the math on Flames Nation. I did some math as well. But uh, in the last 15 seasons... 184 out of 240 of the teams in a playoff position through American Thanksgiving held on to that early success and were able to finally go to the playoffs. Looking at the Flames, uh, in all the seasons since 2005-2006, the Flames, were, uh, when they're in a playoff position, they've made the playoffs five out of eight times. So sort of an interesting stat there. Matt, uh, and just going through this, the... Um, so in 2005, 2006, they were in a playoff spot of Thanksgiving and did make the playoffs. 06, 07, they were not and still made the playoffs. 07, 08, they were not and still made the playoffs. Uh, 08, 09, they made the playoffs and were in a playoff spot of Thanksgiving. 9, 10, they were in a playoff spot of Thanksgiving and did not. And I won't go through all of these. Um, really, they haven't done it again until 14, 15 when they were in a playoff spot and made it. Um, and then the last couple, but I'll post a link in the show notes to where you can find this whole table on from Justin McKenzie at uh, flames nation. If you want to go through it all, Matt, what, do you, what kind of stock do you put in into American Thanksgiving? It's a good metric, uh, just to kind of have like the first early marker, um, of, you know, who's, you know, off to a good or bad start. And it's kind of your, the, your the, quarter point. 
yeah, the caveat that I always have has, is, are any of the teams that are outside of a playoff spot fundamentally changing their systems? Because, like, it, it, usually a team that ha is changing their systems, they tend to struggle right off the hop and then, you know, get better as the season goes along. Um, and we saw that with Calgary where they started at 2-7-1 uh, and one, and now uh, bounced back significantly. Um, so it, it, it's a good indication, but there are some, you know, like you're in some ways you're more likely if you're in like the flame situation to be able to bounce back and up into a playoff spot than, you know, say like Edmonton's uh, where like they just struggled outright and are still struggling. That kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And according to the math that uh, Julian McKenzie did, the Flames, as I mentioned, have been in a, a playoff spot five of eight times at the th – or sorry, when they've been in a playoff spot at Thanksgiving, five of eight times they've made it to the playoffs, which is less than the league average of 62.5 times. I understand where teams are going with this, but it's still only a quarter point. And I think a better metric personally is the new year. Like, you know, yeah, there's that's, there, you're, yeah, that's, you're 21 games in and, you know, yeah, there's still some changes to be made. I mean, you know, you, you've talked in the past in previous seasons about a new coach. You often see a boost or a decline for about 20, 10 to 20 games. Well, teams figure that out. Like, I think you need a larger sample size and really nobody makes trades at this point either because, you know, the, you, the teams want to wait till the new year for cap reasons and whatnot. So I think it's a little premature to, f to know. I mean, right now, I think there's one team we know is not going to playoffs and that's San Jose, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, and, and, and I don't think that's going to change by the, the new year, the halfway point. But to me, I think no, a, and like, if you a better metric is Gen 1. Yeah. Like if you looked earlier in the season, like uh, say like 10, 15 days ago, like the Anaheim Ducks were one of the playoff teams and like frankly they're probably going to finish right around where San Jose is um in the standings like they're not going to be very good either um but they just got a hot start and like they've lost five in a row now and are starting to fall back to where they should be yeah and I personally think Vancouver's still going to regress but I mean you know that's not what the yeah, show's same about here. so you know I think oh, it's, I, know. I think it's a little early to I think U.S. Thanksgiving is a little bit early to put those markers on teams I think Jan 1 is a far better better way to look at that yeah and realistically like the, this Flames team like over the last few weeks uh pretty much just erased the early part of their season where they struggled so mightily and like they're only two points out of a playoff spot with a game in hand on Seattle and it's one of those where you know like should Calgary be better than where they're at now based off of their you know expectations heading into the season yes but all things considered they're not in a terrible spot and it's just a matter of seeing how they can evolve from here. Well, with that, as you were saying, let's take a look at where the flames are right now. And in the Pacific division, they sit fifth. They played 21 games, which is exactly the quarter point with well, 21. Uh, yeah. Um, rounding down or up, but we'll round down to 21. I think 21 and a half would be, um, they have 20 and a half, 20 and a half. You're right. My math is a little off. Um, eight wins, 10 losses, three overtime losses. So let's call 13 losses and eight wins for 19 points. Seattle Kraken are right above us. Like you said, they have 22 games and 21 points. And really, if I look at the Western Conference stats, um, the wildcard stats, the wildcard teams are Seattle and St. Louis, 21 points and 23 points. So the Flames right now are fourth uh, in the wild card standings at 19. So really, let's call it two points out of a wild card spot at this point. Yeah, which all things considered isn't terrible for this team. And like realistically, you know, like I kind of had this team pegged between like sixth and tenth. Um, you know, with the optimistic side, you know, being slightly higher than sixth if you know Huberto and Cadre and sixth to tenth in the in the West. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, optimistically, maybe a little bit higher, but, you know, uh, 
So the fact that they're basically 10th right now is right around where I expected this team to be. Uh, could I see this team falter a bit over the next while and then start to sell off? Definitely. Um, or they could step it up and play well into January, but this upcoming schedule is quite the bear for this team. Well, let's get into some of those things. And I, one that one thing that I wanted to chat about, I mean, as we look at the quarter point, is just what you're saying about selling off. And, you know, a lot of teams might look at U.S. Thanksgiving for that, but... Matt, when do you think it's time for the Flames to decide if they're... And, and let's not say selling assets that aren't UFAs, just for the sake of argument, but when do you decide as the Flames if you you know, keep these UFAs till the deadline or start to sell them earlier? Is it U.S. Thanksgiving? Is there another date you think you look at there? I, I think that realistically, you... Like, after the horrid start, like, the Flames already got their... Uh, beginnings of the exploration of uh trades with teams and like getting the lists of like who's interested in which player and all of that and even though like say calgary continued to struggle in a similar fashion this month like they would not be making trades even right now even if they were where san jose is it's you know you have to kind of leave that for January, February to get serious into completion. So of if you're trades. Connor, I guess, when do you decide which direction you're going to go? Do you decide you're taking the futures deals that are being offered or you're taking the, I guess, now deals that are being offered? Uh, I think that you kind of have to just listen to everything and just be patient unless somebody blows your socks away. But uh, and realistically... I think that you have to respect the team enough where you give them a bit of a runway. Like, because they have fought rather hard to get back into some semblance of being an okay team again. Um, and, you know, like the veteran guys that are on this team, you know, you can't really, like, go and blow it up right now and undercut all their efforts because that's just going to breed some resentment in the team because, oh, we gave it our all to get back into, you know, 500 land or in the neighborhood and, you know, getting undercut. But I think that uh, I would give it until January before things get serious. And, like, if the Flames are not in the playoff spot on January 1st, I think that you start, like, really initiating the selling off of guys like the Zadorovs, the Tanevs, the Hannafins, the Lindholms, and... Yeah. It, it might not necessarily get done until the trade deadline, but at least get that ball rolling in a more serious tone. Yeah, or at least know which, you know, discussions to have, right? Because I think that you can be having the discussions of, um, you know, is this team a playoff team and are we sort of building around veterans and stuff for the playoffs? Or is it a, you know, a case where we want to bring in future assets, whether those are draft picks, young players like Sharon Govich, whether those are prospects. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think that January 1st is probably the time. You might not make the deal then, but I think that that's probably your drop dead date if you're Conroy to decide one way or the other. Yeah, and like realistically, like if the Flames are within five points of a play playoff spot either way, I think you have to lend more to the sell aspect. But uh, if you're on the positive end of like actually being in a playoff spot, I think that you're more likely to take a uh, now type trade return instead of a pure futures return. So, I mean, based on where the league is right now and based on where the flames are right now, I think you and I can probably agree the best this team's going to do is uh, third in the Pacific. Yeah. So, even if you're third in the Pacific, which means you're not a wild card team, is like. Is there a wrong move? To me, if the Flames were to go out, remember a couple of years ago when they gave up a first for Yarn Croak, which in the end looks really stupid, uh, stuff like that. It was the second and a third, but yeah. Sure, yeah, but even then, high picks. Like, to me, you can't go out there as the Flames this year. I can't see them being in any position where, you know, they will they can acquire veterans. I think you've either got to run with what you've got or rebuild. Yeah, I there is no... 
way in my mind that it makes any sense to buy anything. No. Um, I mean, if you trade a guy like Zadora for another guy, sure. But if the Flames start trading away draft picks as you're trying to make a run for it, I think that that's the most foolish thing they could do, knowing where they're going to be. Yeah, the only thing I could see them doing is like a prospect for like a number six defenseman. But, you know, like I would not want to spend more than the fifth. And that's provided the Flames are comfortably in a playoff spot. At the trade deadline, like it's just yeah, but even the then, I think between and- D. Simone and um, and Gilbert, they've shown that they pro and I mean even Osterley, who we've still got around, they probably have that number six covered if they need to. I know it, it's one of those where the whole thing, like honestly, I I do not really envision a scenario where this team adds at the trade deadline, and so like I was really kind of grasping for straws yeah. at this point because. Like that's about it. Like and I the think Flames, even good even for, yeah. Go ahead. Like the Flames' good fourth liners are like all the younger guys anyway, and kids on the farm. So you know, and like Peltier should be back by then as well. So like, there's not really any urgency for adding any like forward depth. So it's just one of those where I have to wait and see. And I mean, again, based on what we know now and where the team is. I think they'd also be foolish to let their, you know, think that they can keep their UFAs through the playoffs to get impact from them and let them walk for nothing. Like, you know, I think that they have to find a deal unless they get a deal done with those guys. I think you've got to find a new yeah. home for Lindholm, Hannafin, that sort of thing. And to me, if they're in a playoff spot, you know, at the deadline, great. Let your young guys like Postel, like Zari, have a run at the playoffs if you're still in that spot. But I think we can all agree this isn't the year to, you know, hang on to those UFAs, not get a return on them, and hope for, you know, a, a long playoff run. No, like the the Flames would be absolutely idiotic if they were, like, say, eighth or below and, you know, decide to hang on to everybody for the chance of making the playoffs. Like, that would just be... Or even the chance, I mean, yeah. even if they're in the playoffs for the chance of making it out of, let's call it the first two rounds. Yeah, like, it, it's just not, you know, like, it's just not going to happen. Like, and you know, I could see them maybe sneaking into the playoffs at this point. I can't see them getting out of round one. And if they're no. lucky enough, they're not making out of round two. So keeping a bunch of UFA assets that could get you something in the future for two, you know, let's call it two rounds of the playoffs. No, like realistically the Flames are in a good spot right now to be able to rebuild on the fly and be able to get enough assets where you can effectively rebuild on the fly. And you know, parlaying the cap space um that you would be shedding from moving out the Hannafins, Lindholms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, into new UFAs and let the prospects come up naturally, you know, because, like, Peltier will be in a full-time spot next year. Uh, Coronado, same and thing. And, I mean, Coronado's and, looking really good with the Wranglers right now. I could even see him getting another look at that point, too. If you ship out, yeah. you know, a forward, let's call it Lindholm for the sake of argument, and you need a forward body, I think at that point it's, you know, Coronado's probably your guy. Yeah, and Poirier probably, like, if the Flames do sell off, the three defensemen they'll probably he'll get some games at the end too yeah so um, Oviev will probably come back yeah and like frankly like this team is in a good spot to get a whole bunch of assets the flames have been one of the best drafting teams uh since 2015 so you know the more bullets you have in the chamber the more chances you have of actually hitting the target yeah and, and even if not draft picks like i don't think it's feasible to trade all the the assets oh for no picks, but, but you know, you know even doing that to foley like deal and bringing in a younger roster player yeah oh no and it's one of those where like if you can parlay uh sort of like uh washington last year where they uh traded off orlov uh, to boston for a draft pick and then flip that draft pick to get Lilligren, I think it was, off of... Or no, it was Sandine, off of Toronto. And Sandine's been really good for them ever since. And it's one of those where, like, the Flames, if they can basically horse trade their way into, you know, a good asset, like, that might be a viable way of doing it. It's just, you know, the Flames realistically have to 
like the, it, there was no situation where like keeping or letting all those guys go as free agents makes any sense for this team. And I don't even think at this point letting one of them go. No, like uh, you pretty much like uh, even if you're keeping any of them, like that's fine. Like if you're extending Hannafin for seven years, great, sure, cool. You you know you can pencil him yep. in for the next but seven you, years. You that's can't great. let the asset walk at this point. No, like you can't let a player who's going to be worth at least the first and two seconds and or equivalent players walk for nothing. Like you're you're just stupid at that point. Yeah, and I agree with what you're saying earlier. This team's fought hard to get where they are. Like, I think Conroy needs to give them a little bit more time to see, was this a flash in the pan, or are they going to keep fighting? Because we've seen with many teams, and even some previous iterations of Calgary Flames, they look good for 10 games, and they, you know, it's gone. Yeah, well, like, we, we saw uh, Huberto struggle a little bit in the Colorado game. Like, he was hot for four or five games. and Yeah, and I think know, that it, just might be the nature of the back-to-back. Yeah, and it's one of those. Yeah, you know, it, it's still a question mark, and I, and I, frankly, I like with the Flames' schedule coming up, like they're playing Vegas, Dallas, Vancouver, Minnesota, Carolina, New Jersey, Colorado. Like that's they're know. really running the gauntlet between now and Christmas. I mean, like you said, if we look at this, they're playing a lot of top teams, right? This week, Vegas and Dallas again. Um, they've got the Canucks. Uh, they have Carolina in there, New Jersey, Colorado again, Vegas again. Um, you know, they've got Tampa Bay, yeah. who who now that they have their goalie back, I think is going to look a lot better. Like, yeah. you know, they, Florida they've got, again. Yeah, they got yeah. A, the Flames have a heck of a month coming up. Yeah, like realistically, the only air quotes easy games are the Anaheim Ducks on the 21st. Um, and the Philadelphia Flyers on New Year's Eve. And yeah, that's it. and I would even say, you know, they might get a bit, bit of a breather on the 14th, the night of our meetup, when they take on the Wild. Yeah, but, like, there's not a ton of breaks for this team, and this is where I think, like, all of this will kind of sort itself out, because, like, with the nature of playing, like, 10 games against elite teams, you know, if the Flames walk through that gauntlet and are still in a playoff spot or nearby, you know, like that, that's an actual achievement. And, you know, if you look into January, most of the games are against the deadbeat teams. So it's one of those where if they can get through January and be effective, then, Hey, maybe this team might actually be a good team but I don't see that happening necessarily. No, so, I, I agree and with I you. I think that'll sort itself out one way or the other. And then, you know, moves in January will correspond to all of that. Yeah, I mean, I could potentially see a move for Zadorov if he still wants to be traded just, you know, to get him out of here if he doesn't want to be here. But in terms of, you know, figuring out which way to go in the future... Um, yeah, I think it'll be January. And like you said, I think after seeing the teams, the flames play between now and Christmas, you'll know what this team is, right? Can they play with the big boys or not? And we're about to find that out. Yeah. And I'm grateful that they're getting like this kind of adversity now out of the way. Cause you know, um, this team, if they're, there is anything there it will sort itself out presently and if there's not and like this team is more the october flames then that too will become evident and i frankly as long as the flames get assets at the end of the day in some way for like either keeping the player or you know trading it off for uh whatever iteration of picks or players they get you know, like they need to ensure that one or the other happens. And, you know, it'll be an interesting time for this team. Yeah. And we've used the term rebuild a lot. I think, you know, maybe the term you and I should start to use is getting younger, right? I mean, we're seeing some of that with Zari coming in, with Postula coming in. I think even if the Flames move these UFAs, you're not moving any of these guys for purely futures. At this point of where the flames are, I think you'll get no. And realistically, you're going to target like you look at the the flames farm system, right? And 
like they need some high end scoring, but that that is where you're going to need guys in the draft. But you know, like the second tier, like middle of the line forwards, like uh, Peltier, uh, Zari, and Pospisil, like we have guys like that filtering through. It's more like we need NHL ready defensemen, which you know you can specifically target, like in a Hannafin trade. You know, give me your good young defenseman that you have if you want Hannafin, and you know, add on to whoever that young good defenseman they have is, and there you go. And you know, it's one of those kind of situations where like the Flames would be specifically needing to target getting that good young D man, whomever that is, um, whether it's like a guy like Sandine or you know. Yeah, whichever team's variation. And of even that if it's is. not a guy who's in the NHL right away, like I look at you know no. the, the Kachuk deal where Cole Schwint came back, he's still really not an NHL level player, but a guy they can put into the system. I think sometimes it's safer to bring in the devil you know versus the devil you don't. You never know what you're going to get with that pick. So if the Flames yeah. see a guy in somebody's system they like, even if it's a 22, 23 year old who's already turned pro, in you know I'm I'm not opposed to that, but I think there's been a lot of talk about fans thinking the Flames are just going to ship these guys out for picks. And that's not going to happen. Sure, I would expect picks to come back, but I think the team would be foolish to move any one of these UFAs for just futures. Yeah, and like realistically, you're more more apt to get a high-quality prospect like a former first-round draft pick defenseman or, you know, a guy on the cusp or a guy in his rookie year. Um, and for a guy like Hannafin. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Like, the, this team, like, there are so many different possibilities at their avail, and, you know, like, they they have a really dynamite opportunity because of the fact that, um, like, the hardest thing that I find that teams that go into rebuild is getting high-quality secondary players because they're so focused on getting the next star player that you know the secondary effort to get the the rest of the team is kind of you know like first things first we need good players and then you know figure everything else out but calgary already has a high quality like middle to bottom six and you know good defensive prospects coming up so and Dustin Wolf, so like they have enough throughout their organization where they just realistically need like the high impact defensive prospect and the high impact forward prospect to come in, and whether that's getting those guys in trade or. And I think a good thing for the Flames too is yeah. the contracts of these guys. I mean, you know, you look at the Oilers, who I think right now we all know need to make some moves. They got such terrible contracts, it's going to be hard to move those. I mean, you know, if we were to contact team and say, hey, do you want Lindholm for the rest of the year? He's arguably a top two center at $4.8 million. Who's not going to find a way to fit that in, right? You look at a guy like Hannafin, who's a top four defense at less than yeah, five. like literally, there are literally 31 teams that would be knocking their doors down to get that player, like, yeah, Hannafin at 4.9, Tanafin, you know, Tanev at 4.5, Zadorov at 3.75. Like, the assets the Flames have, there's so many quality assets with good contracts right now. Oh, this team's going to be the, foolish not to make the best of yeah, it. Yeah, and the contract value is key because the Flames, if they were to decide to retain salary to, like, help a certain team out that's, like, really cap strat. Uh, you know, and getting a, a further asset, like say you eat half that's of it, that's going to cost them, you know, ha eat half of Lindholm's contract or, you know, say eat half of Lindholm and Hannafin's contract and take like a $4 million player off of the team you're trading them to. Like you, you know, like, could you imagine like a team like Boston, how much that they would give to basically in effect, slot both Hannafin and Lindholm in for like less than $5 million. Like they would be like, here's all well, I was going to say. If, yeah. If you take half of those two contracts, you're pretty much getting a free player. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like that buy one, get one free. Yeah. 
and Calgary can easily afford to do that this year. And, you know, like, if that means that, like, the Flames get, like, an additional first-round pick for those two players, then, yay? <laughs> like, that, you know, thanks. And, you know, I, that's where, like, Calgary has to weaponize their cap space. And also, like, I wouldn't be shocked uh, if they acquired a player or two at the trade deadline that were purely cap dumps for teams like to help facilitate as well. For sure. Uh, but you can't go out and get, you know, you can't go making the yarn croak deals no. thinking you're in it this year. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, right. I, I, I can see them. Like you said, acquiring and helping somebody out and getting paid for doing that. But this team cannot act. I mean, even if they're going to make it to one round of the playoffs, so what? Like you don't go and acquire because of that. No, and real. I think to me, playoffs are a luxury this year. Yeah, like realistically, the Flames need to be picking in the top fifteen in this year's draft. The higher, the better. Frankly, uh, not you know to cheer for losses or anything like that. It's just realistically, this team needs as good of a prospect as they can get. But and that's true of all teams they are picking the top 15. Yeah, and, you know, hopefully hit a home run with that player, whomever it is, and, you know, um, hope that you've picked yourself a top six scorer, uh, assuming that they go forward. Uh, realistically, in this particular draft, you will be drafting a forward. <laughs> but, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see, and this team has a lot of options at their avail. It's just... Yeah, it, like looking at the Colorado game specifically, like you look at the impact that McKinnon and McCarr had, and you know, like the last time the Flames had anybody that was that good was Aginla, and you know, like it, it's one of those where, um, if the Flames are going to ever win a Stanley Cup, like they need to get a player of that caliber. And you can only really draft those guys because they don't tend to come up on the free agent market or trade market at all. Yeah, and even if not this year, I think, you know, we've talked about this. This is going to be a multi-year process. Oh, yeah. So even if you don't get that guy this year, potentially, you know, in the future. Oh, for sure. And, like, it's not likely that this team is going to just magically be a one-year down-and-out team and then be magically awesome again next year. Like, They've got good secondary players, but they need the primary guys, and that's the hard part. <laughs> well, moving on here, there's one last topic I wanted to chat with you about this week, and a number of people, um, when we asked on social media, what do you guys want to talk about this week, had the same thoughts I did when I was putting together our agenda, and that's the power play. And I know uh, Ryan Swanson, seven, at 76 Swanson on Twitter, mentioned this. Um, a number of people mentioned this. Flames power play, not looking good right now. And, I, you know, we saw that this week when they were taking as many penalties as they did in the Nashville game and I'd say even the Colorado game, that that was really their Achilles heel, I think, to success in Colorado especially. Matt, what do you think the problem is here? Is it new coach Mark Savard? Is it the system? Is it the players on the power play? Is it a little bit of everything? Yeah, uh, I think that the Flames... Like, when the they first started uh, in the preseason... Like, they were moving the puck really effectively and skating and making spaces for themselves to shoot or make good quality cross-size passes. And I'm not seeing the Flames... Like, they literally will just pass it back and forth between one guy and another, and the point guy might flip it to the other side, and they just pass it around the perimeter, and the Flames basically kill their own power play. And it it's one of those... That's a good way to put it. You know, like, the Flames really are making it easy on the opposition, and, like, there's no dynamism at all to this, you know, and that's how you score on the power play is by getting the defenders to actually move effectively so that way you create lanes and openings for passes to generate shots. And, like, this team just... Basically, everybody just stands there and waits for the game to come to them. And do you think that's as it's been drawn up by power play coach Mark Savard, or do you think that's just the players I, doing what what's kind of instinctual on the ice? I think that's more instinctual. What's on the ice, based off of 
like frankly there's not much difference between this power play and last year's iteration uh which was terrible too and like it's a slightly different format but the end result is the same where nobody actually moves on the power play and everybody just stands around and waits basically and like there is standing around and waiting and also i think for me part of the issue is they're trying to be too pretty yeah. maybe that's the way to say it like they're they're trying to wait for the right shot as opposed to just put the puck on the net yeah and like i can understand like needing to you know make sure that you're not like shooting it into the defender in front of you but you know, that's where you need to actually move so that way you're not in front of a defender so that way you can get your shots through. And, like, the Flames are not really getting any point shots at all. Um, well, and that was one thing I was going to say, too, and I noticed this in the Colorado game. Like, a winger would get challenged. They'd send it back to the point. The defenseman wouldn't be ready. It would go outside the blue line. Now they got to waste time coming out and going back in. Like, send it to the point if there's a point shot. But when the defenseman did get it, then the two of them just pass it back and forth for a little bit. Oh, I know. And, you know, like, realistically, the only guy that lately... Well, there have been two guys that have been shooting effectively from the point, And that's uh, Noah Hannafin and Nikita Zadorov. And... Like, I'm finding that those two are finding a way to actually generating the shots, but they're not primarily being used on the power play. And it, and I'm not going to criticize uh, Rasmus Anderson uh, on the first power play unit because he is basically being put in a position where he's not allowed to be successful because uh, when... In the past, when he's been a, a very good on the power play, he's been moving around a lot more than he has this year. And I don't know if that's a design feature of this power play or some just flaw in the system or whatever, but like Raz is not moving very much and he's not being able to create space for himself because like in the past when I've seen him generating offense on the power play he'll move he'll even skate down the line you know along the boards a bit and then fire a puck but you know like he's not uh being able to create the normal lanes for himself uh being the lone guy back there and it, it the whole thing is just a mess I think you hit on a key point, though. When I look at, is this a Mark Savard issue? Is this a system issue? Is this a player issue? A lot of these issues persisted last year as well. And that's why I think a lot of it is a personnel issue. And I don't think it's a systems issue. I have to believe Mark Savard knows what he's doing. I mean, he his power play looked pretty good with the when he was coaching the OHL. So I can't imagine that a lot of these things are by design. And I think also Husk is smart enough to know, hey, Mark, that's not working. Let's try something different. But it's really hard for me to evaluate what the power play should be when we're not seeing it being successful. Yeah, well, and th those power plays generally are fairly simple overall where you need to get the other team to move in order to score. And, like, if they're able to box you out and just create the either the tight or loose box in front and not really let anything through you're not going to score on the power play and calgary is not penetrating the box at all regardless of what system the other team's using and like you you rarely see any shots from anywhere in between circles from the flames on the power play and you know like what Harkening back to the Gaudreau Kachuk era, um, when the power play was extremely effective, like those guys would be getting pucks to Lindholm in front of the net, and you know, all of the three of those guys would be, you know, in close and taking shots, and the Flames power play was quite effective. And like, this is not that, <laughs> no, and, and you know, again, another reason I, I think that their fate is sealed this year. Yes, you can improve it at this point, but I think, you know, it's going to take 10 games to see any marketable improvement if there is any. And, you know, when they're losing games, arguably because of their special teams, 
you can't have that if you're gonna go deep in the postseason. No, like you need to have a at least an average power play. You can't have a terrible power play. Exactly. So you know, maybe maybe with this home stand coming up, six games, lots of home time, they'll work on this, and we'll see it a bit more. But at this point. I, again, you know, going back to what people asked, where do you put the blame? I put the blame on the players. Yeah. How about you? I agree. It, it's one of those where the players have to realize that there is space for them to create things, but they actually have to make an effort to actually going into those spaces to draw people away from their spot to you in order to be able to make that pass so that way that guy can then make a pass and you know like there's just none of the secondary things happening that in order to make any of it successful i agree well i think that about wraps up this week uh should we look ahead at the week that is definitely or the week that is coming i should say and again before we do just a reminder we mentioned at the top of the show Set it in your calendar, December 14th, 6 p.m. We're going to be at the Bow River Brewing Tap House for a meetup. It's not a live show, but it's a chance for Matt and I to meet you guys, um, hang out, watch the Flames game together, talk hockey. Maybe we can sit down together and solve the power play issues, and we'll we'll write to Savard and let him know what we all came up with. <laughs> but we'd love to see you there. Uh, we'd love to have you hang out with us on the 14th. You can find more details at our website, firesidechat.ca, and the navigation at the top, you'll see Bow River Brewing Meetup. In the show notes, I'll have a link to these, or you can go to firesidechat.ca slash meetup2023. So, Matt, we've got three games, the first three of a six-game homestand coming up. Um, the Flames on Monday, tomorrow, when when we're recording. Monday, probably the day most people hear this. 7.30 p.m., uh, the Vegas Golden Knights are in town. Then they get a two-day break, and on Thursday, 7 p.m., the Stars, we get a rematch against them. And then Saturday, Hockey Night in Canada, the late game against the Vancouver Canucks. Last week, you and I didn't do very well. I thought we'd win Seattle, Colorado, lose Dallas, Nashville. or so, And you thought we would win Seattle, Nashville, Colorado, and lose Dallas. So close, but no cigar. What are you going with this week? Uh... I think that we'll win the Dallas game again, just because. Um, okay. I think we're going to lose to Vegas, and I think we'll beat Vancouver. So you're going to say we we win Dallas and, and uh, Vancouver? Yeah. And lose to Vegas? Vegas is starting to seem like a nemesis for the Flames. Like, when I look around the league, it seems like Dallas and Vegas are the two of the teams these guys just can't beat. I agree. Um, and because of that, I'm going to go the opposite. I'm going to say they win Vancouver. I think they're going to lose Vegas and then they're going to lose Dallas. So usually you're the one that comes in more negative. Um, I'm going to go with the negative spin this time and say, you know what? The flames are going to lose two of them. Well, you know, last year I did win the prediction challenge by being extremely negative. That's true. So that's not that's not an award we want to promote, though, Matt. Oh well, it was only because I was extremely negative. So gonna there you go. You know, don't want to win that for two years in a row. So gotta go a little yeah, bit I, more I, positive. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the the flames are looking good, and I think that they're up for some adversity. And when I look at this, I think this might be the week that they get that adversity. I agree. Do you see Dan? Do you see Dan Vladar anywhere? Uh, probably the Dallas game, just to give them a different look. Give them a different look. Just played them. Yeah, I would. I would agree there. I wouldn't be surprised if both teams play their backup. I wouldn't be surprised if after yeah uh, the Flames lit up Ottinger the way that they did, if we see Scott Wedgwood. Uh, oddly, I think that um, if I was Dallas's coach, I'd put Ottinger back in just because if he's a competitive he's got player. To prove. It's like, oh, you did that to me last time, huh? Okay, let's go. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, and if you put him in, though, I think he's on a short leash. Yeah. He doesn't get seven goals against again. No. You know, I think if you get, you know, three goals against in half a game, he comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll see what happens there. Hopefully uh, I'm wrong here and the Flames get more than – one of the three games this week or two of the six points on the table, but I guess we'll see. And Matt, I will talk to you next week when the calendar turns to December. And as always, go Flames, go. 
Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.